Okay, how many of you knew that the J.C. Ralston Arboretum had an internship program? You all know that. That's probably why you're here. Um, well, we do. We have an internship program that um, is, got, kind of got started when Bob Lyons was the director and um, slowly but surely grew to the point where we now have four, four interns, okay, hopefully soon to be five, but four interns that spend the entire summer here. It's become actually quite competitive, um, not just for horticultural science um, students at NC State, but also for other majors. Um, in fact, one of the speakers tonight was not a horticultural science major, but ag education, and so that's, that's kind of a cool thing. Um, and um, it is, uh, it's become quite, quite a reputable internship. And the interns not only spend time working here, but they also spend time learning here, they spend time <coughs> traveling, and um, it's, it's really become quite, a, a, quite a, a pearl of an internship where we, we feel like it's, it's as good if not better than <coughs> Duke University's in <laughs> Duke <University. laughs> We do have a number of our students who go there as well. Anyway, tonight's um, presentation is entitled The Tale of Two Interns and Two Cities. Uh, Justin Durango and Colby Gupton were uh, both interns here in 2012 and if you want to find out how good they were talk to talk to um, Tim he'll tell you all about um, how good they were but they were interns here and um, Colby was an ag education major graduated uh, this past May and he's now a teacher bless you uh, at Bunn High School and he's he this right now he's teaching ag, ag mechanics and horticulture and so um, I'm sure that, that that's a whole nother seminar for another night. And Justin Durango, it seems like Justin's been a, one of our students I'm just gonna stay forever. <laughs> it's been for quite some time, but we're really pleased with that. Um, Justin is in the landscape design concentration, and we're excited because he's going to be graduating. He's probably more excited, and his wife's probably more excited than we are, that he'll be graduating um, actually in a few weeks. Yes, sir. So um, with that, um, here's, here's what happened. Many, many years ago, thanks to some anonymous donors, an opportunity came where a student could apply and receive a special um, uh, funding to travel to the Chelsea Flower Show. And this started way, way back before we had any intern, internship program here at the Ralston Arboretum. Only to find out, as of late, within the past year, that um, the monies had kind of kind of got lost and were rediscovered. And so we were able, we were now able to resurrect this travel scholarship, if you will, and within that context are now focusing it on and making um, it available to either current or former interns at the Ralston Arboretum. And it comes with a stipend to go to the Chelsea Flower Show in England and perhaps travel to other places in Europe. Well, Justin and Colby were the first recipients, new first recipients of this, this um, scholarship and um, traveled together to Chelsea Flower Show this past spring and um, in England and on to France. And so I don't want to take any more of their time because um, I've, I've heard a couple of stories and seen a few slides and you're in for a treat. So guys, thanks very much for doing this and welcome and we'll turn it over to them. This is going every year. That is the plan, that it would happen every year and that interns would be, only J.C. Ralston Arboretum interns would be. And volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, thank you, Bryce, for that. Um, to begin with, I wanted to thank, first off, the J.C. Ralston Arboretum staff and the whole mechanism that keeps it going, as well as the horticulture department and NC State, along with Krug Farms, the uh, the nursery up in Wales, who, because of a good relationship with J.C. Wells Arboretum, is one of the reasons we're able to go into the, uh, the Chelsea Flower Show in the first place. Um, and also, of course, all the wonderful people that we met, and we all sitting here to come visit this. So, to begin, as Bryce alluded to, we were interns in 2012. Um, Entering the internship, we there was no blip on our radar as about a trip to Chelsea. Never heard of it. So this will be a quick synopsis of what we entered into as interns, what we experienced as interns, and show quickly why we liked it so much. 
Uh, so that's Colby. And if you have walked through this part of the garden recently, you know the difference that's there. That's right next to the annual trial beds. Um, uh, initially, this was going to be called what the plantsman's was. I'm not sure what it's called now, Tim. Oak Grove. Okay, there you go. Um, so as interns, we got to do a variety of really exciting things like <laughs> prep beds and mulch. <laughs> Colby's doing hard work on all these. Dig some holes and then prep some more beds and then dig some more holes <laughs> and then move some stuff. <laughs> but really, so that was you know proud moment there, getting this big stump out. This is the townhouse garden. Um, that wasn't it. We did some cool stuff. Simple. This is an easier day when we plant in the front sign out there. But you know, we also got to do fun things like build Lizzie's desk for her when she was first arriving. <laughs> um, we made a little flower arrangement for her. Um, and then we got to do cool things like learn how to drive a skid steer um, or a dingo or use an air spade in a hazmat suit, which it looks like a lot of fun, and it is a lot of fun. Uh, for about five minutes, <laughs> you realize it's actually grueling labor to do that in 95 degree weather, but it was very fun. That was, uh, if any of y'all remember Rebecca Pledger, it was her rain garden trial bed that we were doing some work with. Um, we also got to experience learning from really skillful plantsmen like Philip Dark here at Oakmont Nursery, we got to go tour Metro Lino, which was immense and unbelievable. Um, not even that far away, I had no idea a world-class greenhouse or, or nursery was, was that close. Um, we learned about all things water-related from Mr. Davis. We learned about beekeeping from Mr. Heatherly. Got a pruning lesson from Dr. Builderback. But yeah, I need to stop because this is not all about the internship. I just wanted to preface we did some work, we were happy with it, we learned a lot, we had a great time, and by the end of this summer, we had a, we were just super happy, and we're like, man, it was a really wonderful internship, we made some money, we got to learn some things, we met some really fun people. Um, and then what happened was, we got to come back, and they said, here's another opportunity, here's an extra perk working as an intern at the Arboretum, there is a chance to put your name into the hat for a scholarship, and the the requirements for acceptance are that you have to be an ex-intern at the Arboretum and you still have to be a full-time student. So there were like six of us. So it was a really good uh, <laughs> chance of going to this thing, so we were excited about it. So we all went in and, uh, and Colby and I were lucky enough to get, uh, get going. So Colby, I've been doing a lot of talking. I'll let you kind of talk about some of the few <laughs> lessons we learned. Well, well the first one's a, a, a direct result of my mistake in the first place. So I guess it's pretty and pretty appropriate that I'm explaining this one. But luggage for connecting flights, they're going to arrive at your destination. If you're on your connecting flight, um, you don't actually have to pick it up in the airport that you're arriving to. So my luggage was headed to Heathrow Airport, and we were in Toronto, Canada, and I was waiting on the turnstiles looking for <laughs> Where is it? Where is it? And then we can hear our flight being called, and we're running to the gates. I'm running through Toronto Airport. I think we just barely get there. They were just about to pull, pull off and go to Heathrow, all because I was looking for luggage that I didn't know was already making its way to England. Um, uh, I'll let just, Justin uh, tie in too, but the second one never mentioned anything about working anywhere when going through customs in the UK. Uh, we had a bit of a hard time getting through customs in the UK. I think, you know, why are you here? Are you on vacation? Well, no, we're actually part of this this work study scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> we actually did an internship in the U.S. and now we're going to go work at the Chelsea Flower Show. Oh, do you have a work visa? <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, it's just this this working thing. Is that your friend over there? Is he right there? Is he with you? And so, yeah, we're going to go verify your story with him. Make sure you're not ISIS or something. I don't know what they were worried about. But so there was yeah. a lot of twisting of thumbs at the, the UK Customs. Apparently, it was both of our lucky days. That's what they told us. It's your lucky day. We're going to let you through. They had bigger fish to fry. One thing I had never known, I'd never been to an easy hotel or anything like that. If you ever heard of easy hotels, maybe you know what I'm talking about. But these are very economic hotels. <laughs> about the size of a closet, but it has everything you need to survive. Um, one thing is, the power doesn't work in there unless your key card is <laughs> So the lights come on, you put the card in, you put the lights on, you're like, great. So we were supposed to be up early for the show to work, and both of our phones were like 2% battery life, so we plug them into the wall, charge, go to sleep, wake up like a little bit late. 
what happened? Why did our phones charge? Well, the card was in the wall, so the, the albums don't work either. Anyway, um, <laughs> that was crazy. Uh, something I probably should have known, servers are not going to give you your check until you ask for it in many places that are not here. So we sat there for a good long while being like, this is a real jerk of a server. I'm just sitting there, I'm sitting there with our meal and we're bring the check over. That's something, uh, I guess, novice. Um, we walked out of a bar after getting a drink because it got real quiet in there all of a sudden. And so we said, we're going to go somewhere else that has a little more action to it. And we walked outside, and it was like a ghost town. And you're talking about a city of millions of people, and we could not understand why at 10 30, <coughs> it was so dead. But I guess that's just when things shut down. Asking locals later, they said, that's why we started drinking at noon. So they make up for on the front end. Um, of course, we always ask for advice when doing public transport. People in Paris would like to push the open door on the metro button. I don't know, if, have you been to Paris before? And, and the metro has the open door button. People sit there for like two minutes before you can get to your destination with the finger on the button. I don't know what it is about it, people up there. Um, and if you learn, if you're going to France, learn a few phrases. Um, people are super much more nice to you when you can at least try to say some things to them in their language. And we probably scheduled a bit too much time in the city of romance, being two people who are not romantically entangled with each other. <laughs> two days was probably enough to have the touristy stuff covered. But okay, on to what we actually did there with pictures. <laughs> we did video, so we could be good to start with that. We first got into London walking around. Um, we made about a, a what, like a two and a half hour walk with all of our luggage because we had no idea how to use any of the transport systems. <laughs> so we stopped a couple times for food along the way. Um, and then actually went to Chelsea the day before we were supposed to start working just to say hi, to introduce ourselves, we never met anybody there. Um, and we get to the front gate and you can't step in without a, a name tag, steel toe boots, and a high vis vest on. And it's a very, 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 very tight security. Um, and so they had to go to get a liaison for the group that we were working with to come back to us. And they say, oh yeah, come on inside. And when we got there, they said, oh, you ready to work? Let's go. <laughs> so we started working. Um, we didn't even, we didn't come prepared to work that day. So they even had loners. They had loner steel toe boots that were in the, um, in the actual li liaison's office. And so we got loner equipment and then went to actually work on the site. And when we got in, it was, everything was in process. It was still really impressive. This is actually driftwood around a, a steel skeleton, essentially. This artist does really wonderful pieces. The pictures do it no justice. It was really fabulous. Um, and this was actually right behind our pavilion we're working on. This is like a, a steel figurine that's hair draped down. Somebody kind of, you know, like this pose like this kind of thing. Very interesting. Um, our site was kind of a cluster here when we first showed up, but it was, uh, there was a lot of work going on. Um, huge, huge production. Um, and that is Sue and Jones and Edward, who also works up at Crook Farms Nursery. Um, I know it's happy to have a shirtless selfie with somebody of such prestige, but it's the only one I had. So um, I'm showing it to you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Talk about oh, yeah. stuff. Has anybody seen this before as far as landscape applications? Um, first time we, we'd seen it, so this is kind of a perfect example of where we're traveling. We're kind of we're seeing a, not a new culture, but we're seeing a different culture, different customs. And then we're also getting to see stuff in the landscape industry that's being used. So it's just this honeycomb material, and that's how they held the gravel in place in such a small area. And I imagine you'd use it in a number of areas, maybe at home if you could find it, um, to keep gravel from washing or anything that you have that you need to stay there. But that's kind of how we kept people from standing on the gravel and smushing in a, a big divot or anything of that nature. But um, pretty cool, first time I had seen it, so I was excited about it. The thing is, each yeah. pavilion site, they excavate out of the Chelsea <laughs> hospital grounds. And it's mud pits. I mean, it's these mud pits that go back down about a foot below where you're actually walking on. So you have to do something or else it's going to stay a mud pit. So every, every display <coughs> went to great lengths to um, construct either walkways or guard beds or whatever. It was just a, a mind-blowing level of input and resources that were required to change the place up. Every year they come out and excavate the grounds. Every year they go put the grounds back and it grows back <coughs> and it cycles through every year. It's ridiculous how many tens of millions of dollars go just to move the land around. Um, kind of fast forwarded through all the construction. So this was five days actually. Four or five days we went on site did whatever Sophie Walker, who is the designer, very young upcoming designer with great ideas, she designed the whole cave pavilion, that's what it was called, and essentially what it was, was a very industrial feeling, man-made 
encapsulation of what was supposed to be a very diverse woodland scene that you could have pulled out of perhaps a tropical region. It, it was a pretty cool uh, juxtaposition. But four days of that, we worked on it, did all kinds of number of things. Um, we liked the work, we were excited and, and happy to be done with it so that we could go and do a little more exploring. Um, these were the grounds. Our pavilion was right in here, um, but it was this massive grounds just chock full of stuff. <coughs> so we're going to put some plays on it, uh, we'll talk about some of the stuff that's shooting around in here. Good. Oh gosh. Oh, just uh, like right left there. Are we pressing for one second? Got the laser pointer on the top one. Oh man, now we're in action. Okay, <laughs> so this is actually inside the Great Pavilion, it was just amazing the amount of effort. Um, just this is kind of one that's all assembled, but it was kind of neat to see them splayed out all over the floor. Maybe um, you know a thirty by thirty foot area, they're just splayed out individually, and then by the end of the week, it kind of comes together, and there's this beautiful display. Um, and it, it, it was unreal how many different uh, kind of monochromatic, not monochromatic, as in, uh, sorry, mono species, mono genus, you'd say. Um, just delphinium there, and you go through um, all different lady slipper orchids, um, all the different, all different displays. That one was kind of entangled, it was like a naturalistic garden um, in the center of it, and then there were these displays around the edge um, where it was kind of. Uh, gene specific, uh, really pretty laburnum they brought in. And then golden rain tree right there. Um, just again, Justin mentioned how much effort they have as far as excavating the site every year and then bringing everything back in. So it was just really neat to see the, the immense amount of plant material and some of the age of the plant material that they brought in as well. Um, they had, of course, everything um, in Europe has got to be uh, some type of Florida tree or something that it has been shaved into a hedge and so they brought in a, a lot of that as well in containers and it, again it was just neat to see it pop up not overnight of course it's over the course of several days but it was neat to see so much material appear so fast so many garbage trucks coming through so many loud noises um, jackhammers in one in one section um, water just pouring through the streets where somebody's washing off their sidewalk trying to keep it perfect and pristine. It was amazing not only the amount of labor that went into it, but the attention to detail too. Um, and this kind of comes into the attention to detail point. Right up here, just a bearded iris, um, paper towels wrapped <coughs> around it to actually keep it protected and transport. And something like this, I just I stopped and it was, again, a whole display. Somebody actually took the paper towel roll or took the paper towel, wrapped it around and banned it just to keep it protected in transit. And that's how much attention to detail they paid inside of this, um, this great pavilion. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense, right? Um, you, don't want any, you don't want flowers that are totally tattered and beat up and torn when you're in a, a floral display. But um, just neat, neat, neat for me. And then also these little mats of um, kind of just the wildflowers and the metaflowers of what I consider. Um, I thought it was neat how they brought them in just in these sheets and these rugs and then they kind of cut them to the curve of the contour of any walkway that was there. Um, again, neat to see it three days before on a cart and then finally in the show totally assembled in that display. Pretty neat. Then I've got another one, um, just the amaryllis. Again, the, the attention to detail, they kind of have this little spacer to keep all the pollen grains from dropping down onto the petals. And so just keeping that little bit of yellow dust from, um, from touching on those beautiful red petals. And then also providing a little support for them as well to keep them upright. Again, just an amazing amount of detail and work that goes into something so that I would consider so minuscule before this trip. Um, pretty awesome. I think I've, I've got this one too. Um, this guy right here is actually a local. Um, from Franklin to North Carolina. There's a, a hosta breeder named Bob Solberg. Green Hill Nursery, has anybody been before? He has an open house every, I think, twice a year, if I'm correct. Um, that's one of the newer hostas that he's bred. Uh, it's called Andy Murray. So it was named after, I think I have this correct, the Scottish tennis player won Wimbledon, the first Britain to win in 77 years, is that correct? 
I think I got that. And so that's um, that's actually who it was named after the namesake. So I saw a big hosta display and got a tip to look out for the Andy Murray hosta. So I stopped and I asked. I said, "Well, do you happen to have it here?" He says. Well, yeah, it's right here. I have it in my hand. He pulls it out, and he's actually <laughs> holding a little name tag, and I was trying to get a, a photo op with the name as well. But um, just the exposure kept me from doing that. Uh, but anyway, it's just pretty neat to see something local, something that someone said, hey, you know, look out for it. And here it is, the Chelsea Flyer Show. And then I'll, oh, my. I'll leave the Granger for oh, Justin. Lord. This was at the <laughs> Thailand display, and so England and Thailand have a really um, – at least through the show, I'm not educated on, on their other political entanglements, but through the show there's a huge link between those countries, and this is a display that goes on um, perennially that Thailand puts on. Those are all orchid petals. Um, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of them, but it was, it, they had about 30 or 40 people working around <coughs> the clock, pinning them all into these uh, displays. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, and many of these pictures really don't do it justice. It's just, it's just hard to, to replicate when you're standing there. Um, but so that kind of wrapped up. We got to walk around there after the construction was done. We kind of just walked around to see what everyone else was doing. Um, and then right next to the World uh, Hospital Chelsea is the Chelsea Physical Office. So we walked in there. Um, Linnaeus' uh, old stomping grounds. And uh, it, was a, it was a funky, cool little garden. had uh, some neat sculptures in it. had really nice uh, arrangements. had uh, a lot of medicinals, cool botany collections, um, some uh, medicinals that you might recognize. <laughs> uh, really need some, you know, very formal kind of edged with really wild. Uh, it, it was a neat little garden. It wasn't very really, very large, but it was slam packed. And as you can see, the weather was wonderful over there. It was, it was really nice. A uh, wonderful day to walk around. Um, and I saw this when we were walking out, and I was like, Lord, I wish I got to take a picture of this thing. And so I did, and then I walked in there 10 feet, and I was like, oh, there's another one. And I looked, and I was like, oh, there's another one. I was like, oh, what's the other picture? The rich neighbor, I guess. Our first double-decker bus ride was the bus. We had to um, take a picture of that. And more food. That was a very large company. Um So then after our day where we worked, and then we went to the physical garden the next day, we joined to Q. So we took the train um, out west of London. And this is Colby studying up before we got out there. Um, and then that's me in front of the conservatory, trying not to step on the grass. Um, massive conservatory. For everybody who's been there, I'm sure you know, but if you haven't, it's, it's, just, it's hard to, uh, to describe. There's so much packed in. We took a few pictures here and there, but it's just endless. You could spend uh, years in there, probably. And I was thinking, you know, it says the oldest pop pen in the world. And, and I just come from the Chelsea Physic Garden, and I was thinking, you know, for a, such a sophisticated Conservatory, you think they'd identify the plant a little better than that, but um, it's definitely not a pot. It's a huge side cat. Um, but no, this, the oldest potted plant was amazing. I mean, we obviously had to prop it up because it's growing out of its uh, stability there. That was really cool. Um, and then just showing the, the scale, um, how tall it was, 40, 50 feet in there. It was, it was massive. Uh, the largest tree scarf I've ever seen. So they were working on that. They actually had, had the area cordoned off so they could do that. Um, I didn't know it was so popular. And then the, uh, the little house, the little kind of house was really cool. And this was an old uh, friend. We saw a familiar face out there. That's a, a red oak native to these parts. And so we figured uh, since we saw an old friend, we might as well take a picture with him. Um, and then I got. There's a lot of selfies you've noticed, so I took a picture of Kobe taking a selfie. Which I thought was <laughs> interesting. <laughs> but this was just, I know it seemed like their, their conservatories just went on and on, with all kinds of varieties. There were really sticky, hot, humid, tropical ones. There were arid, there were everything in between. It was really interesting. Um, all kinds of wonderful plants. Everywhere you turn around, there's something stuck in the corner that I had never seen before. Um, and then walking through here, those were just gorgeous. Um, and there was peacocks walking around, which were obviously very accustomed to people walking with them because we got really close to them and didn't really see them. Um, and we're familiar with Cardiochronum giganteum. Mm -hmm. I have tried to grow it several times. I have one in the yard right now, hopefully it will survive the winter. I was very envious when I walked past this and saw giant stands of them everywhere. They weren't quite blooming yet, but I guess if we'd have been back in about a month, we would have been able to show. That's uh, perhaps a non-ideal type of union there graph, but 
I'm like, I guess that's what's going on there. Um, Kobe's checking it out. And uh, at Q, they have what's called the Skywalk, which is this big steel structure where you can go up and walk in the treetops, which is pretty neat. But um, there's somewhat limited views you get because you're in the treetops, so you can pretty much just see the treetops. Um, it's nice, but uh, <coughs> but that's that, yeah. And more food. <laughs> old meat pie, though it was delicious. That was leaving Q at a little cafe. Um, and so the next day. We got to go back to Chelsea when it wasn't under construction, when we were not laborers, when um, there were no high visits visible. It was really a whole different story. I'll let Colby kind of jump back on that one. So that's part of what it, what about this experience was so unique. It was, it was seen, again, from, from some of the beginning stages all the way up to the finished product. And it wasn't only with our display or with Sophie's display, it was just with everyone around us, um, whether they were, they were commercial, there was like a John Deere representative there, there was somebody from the Big Green Egg um, Ceramics Group Company, and even seeing their displays come together, um, although they were a little bit lackluster, uh, I'll take that back, Big Green Egg was, was pretty uh, pretty swanky, but um, this was kind of as you first entered uh, the grounds, this, this big <coughs> arch, and um, of course it, it's just a uh, standout feature uh, in that display, but they actually had a, portion of it you can see it's clear and they had water running already the arc and so you could kind of walk through or meander around and again a big attractive feature there um, kind of speaks to the artistry that's there at the, the showgrounds um, along with those driftwood sculptures that you saw earlier again just the floral displays were unbelievable and the setup for which and then the actual execution um, is a whole nother ball game. What I thought was neat is they have these ropes in front and you're, you're walking through and of course there are people at Chelsea that are from, they're from all over but then they're also, uh, you know, Englanders there and they're actually leaning in, the, well I need this in my garden, I need that in my garden, I need this as well. Um, I saw it with the, the Narcissus display, I saw a lot of them that were leaning in and trying to figure out but again, um, the detail that goes into all these displays um, are it's just astounding. And so we also gained entry for free. We got tickets. Um, Crip Farm was able to get us a couple of tickets, which was awesome. We, we really hadn't um, expected that. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like this trip was just a sequence of us getting lucky and people helping us out and us just being fortunate, kind of naive um, American garden people who didn't really know what was going on, but just very friendly, helpful people everywhere we turned. I mean, that was just the same driftwood sculpture um, that the, the sculptor had everything ready at this point, and it was just kind of, it was very impressive. These were also, can't read the price, but I mean, these were in the tens of thousands of dollars per or pounds per sculpture, so everything here was top shelf, pretty much, at the show. No, that, that kind of speaks to, we, we, in, in making this, Justin had some points that he didn't pull back, and he was going to say, you want to mention one that maybe we forgot that that we heard Chelsea Flower Show and maybe we weren't as familiar with it as we should have been before we were going. So we know we were headed to this event and that it was pretty big, but we had no idea as far as the scale, um, how huge it is and how significant it is. Uh, they are pretty much, I think that's why some doors just flung wide open for us because whenever we sat down at a bar, we sat down at, at a restaurant and we said, we're here, we're helping with the Chelsea Flower Show. Uh, eyes lit up and the conversation began and I said, well, here's the, here's the picture from the grounds today. Oh, we'd love to go. Can you get us tickets? And, um, <laughs> so just incredible. Um, and the, the mass of people. Uh, this was a, the bronze sculpture. A man had a series of them um, that he made and it's kind of these little whimsical um, the elves and gnomes and such that are in the garden. Uh, so it wasn't so, all just plants. There was everything you can imagine for the, the exterior actually and interior. Like <coughs> there was. Speaking like, yeah. Who doesn't need a giant <laughs> shellfish gorilla in their house, right? Uh, this was this was a, an interesting booth because it had these things, these shellfish sculptures. It also had sculptures that were covered in lavender blossoms, so you could smell them from mm -hmm. I don't know, 50 yards away. You're like, where's all that lavender? You go up and it would be a sculpture that size, completely covered in lavender blossoms. Very cool. One of which was a likeness of a, a blues brother kicked back in a chair, covered in dried lavender. So, <laughs> Pretty neat booth this time. And just like Justin was saying, if you have an empty corner in your house, one of these guys would be glad to come to you. I thought that was a 
I'm not sure I just snapped the shot. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really seen that phrase before, but uh, yes, Chelsea Flowers, you got some money to throw around. Oh, okay. And this is impromptu selfie in front of Sophie's display. One of the pensioners is getting explained to about what, what the heck is he looking at. And then Blevin actually caught me doing a selfie, so I don't know what he's thinking or not. But probably just silly in that. Maybe we should have come better equipped with some camera equipment as well. We both we both had iPhones, and all of all of the picture taking was uh, done either using a selfie or in any of our uh, far, further away photos. It's actually mine or Justin, and Justin has a lot of photos of me from far away. So it was actually pretty strange combing through your own photos, and it's like, wow, I thought I took more pictures of myself than that. <laughs> so, Although the selfies appear frequently out of 1,200 or so pictures a piece, um, they don't appear as, uh, as often as um, you would think. But again, you know, Flip and did catch them. What kind of was comical about the situation is the, the pensioner sits down and says, what am I looking at? You know, that kind of just the modern box in the midst of all these, these home garden uh, displays. And again, they were, they were more vamped than that, but everybody had kind of a reflecting pool in their garden and they had um, a little uh, home feature, they had a sitting area, but Sophie's it was just a solid <coughs> bench or a solitary bench in front of this window into the wilderness kind of deal. So she was, it was interesting to see the designer's thoughts being explained to um, an older gentleman who maybe or may not be set in his ways and uh, trying to explain the new up and coming style, I guess. Um, pretty neat. Uh, BBC was covering the grounds. Um, there was pretty, uh, the day before it opened, there were booms everywhere. Um, you couldn't walk for a camera crews. Uh, this is one of those snapshots where Sophie's being interviewed about her design. Just up on the big green egg display, I was trying to do a panoramic of, of just the scope, uh, scope of the, the show itself. Um, I never seen this picture, but there were throngs on either side of throngs. Um, so, Chelsea's pretty much uh, wrapped up in our trip so far. Um, we went, we worked, and we went back and visited, and then we were on to different things. At the end of the trip, um, when we were walking around Chelsea, um, we were introduced to Colin Crosby, who is curator at, at Wisley, and he called up and he said, hey, I got a couple of American guys come in, let them in for free. And that kind of thing. I mean, how does that happen? So, we, we went straight away to Wisley, and um, it's amazing, you know, the gunner, the huge stuff, the cool little boxwood garden with this bench carved into the same kinds of shapes. Um, just the long, I guess, fairway with the uh, borders on both sides. It was, it was, the scope was huge and impressive. I thought this was really cool, the corners Canada, and since I hadn't seen it, just because we're down in the south, but um, I guess if you go up to Canada and whatnot, it's uh, pretty common. But uh, I just saw a ground covered dogwood, and I was, I was really true. Um, this is some kind of fruit that's been grafted into a really cool type of dome, uh, gazebo thing I thought was really neat. Um, the garden itself was just very, very cool, a bunch of small outdoor spaces, big outdoor spaces, but a huge variety. I love this combination of the rhododendron and the, um, the dogwood there, that was really beautiful. Um, this little butterfly bush, which I, I didn't know what it was until I got, got a bottom of the leg, uh, um, I thought Dr. Warner would appreciate something like that. Um, a bonsai display there, which was quite impressive. There's a full walk with um, hundreds of year old trees. Um, unfortunately, this is about the best shot we got of the Wisley Rock Garden, and that is like, Wisley is like, this rock garden is bodacious. So it's really bad that we didn't get great pictures of it. I have videos, but it was going to bog this down even more than our uh, long windedness if I put videos in here. Um, but that's the rock garden. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. And if you can't go there, look it up on Google. It's really cool. Um, I put this in because I was just like, you know, what do you do? What do you do? You just need that. Nothing else you can do when you're trying to frame that graphic. But I was um, pleased, I guess, to see that even in such a hugely sophisticated and well-funded garden, you know, there's some things you just you can't throw money at. you got to leave a little block there. It's just going to happen. Um, so, more beer and food. We, we are leaving England at this point. We have decided that uh, we're going to spend a week in England. We're going to spend five days in Paris. We're going to come back to England for two days before we have to return, so we have our bearings. This was right before we took the Channel Tunnel over to Paris. Um, 
This was on the London side. This is when we got in France. It was a cool trip. Not much to see. You're in a tunnel underwater, so. Um, but saw uh, you know a native, which is kind of interesting, walking it off around. They do very significant um, bracing work for their new plantings. You don't really see that level of sturdiness on the brake. We'll, we'll put some hose around something, you know. <laughs> you guys get here so I guess because the plants a little better. Versailles. If you're going to Paris, you're going to go check out Versailles, right? So that's what we did. Um, that's as close as we got to inside of it. Um, we said, oh, thank you. We decided we're just going to do the gardens. So we stayed outside. It was a pretty nice day, kind of off and on, a little drizzly here, but it was really nice. Um, if anyone's been to Versailles or knows about it, there's a bunch of marble sculpture. There's a bunch of um, different different media, not just marble, but all kinds of sculptures, so there's some of it. There's all kinds of this, that's the orangerie. Um, mega huge, very interesting, very beautiful, way over the top. I, I can understand why they chopped their heads off. It's like, come on people, <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> this is just crazy, enough of this. Um, so just the huge, it's the scope, and of course, you know, the story, they can't run the fountains because it drains Paris, and so they have very special events where they'll run it for brief periods. And they usually involve some type of fireworks as well and, and, uh, and whatnot. So that's me staying in front of this huge pool. Back behind there, they would have mock battle, you know, sea battles and whatnot. Um, giant hedged uh, beach. It was just crazy the, the amount of work that goes into maintaining this type of stuff. Um, and there's Colby wearing his proper French colors there. For, uh, <laughs> and of course, you go to Paris hit the touristy spots. I won't go into detail about that because we didn't really spend that much time. We didn't go up the top. We did go up the top of Dr. Trump, which was under construction. Um, and that was a view, one of the angles, which I thought was really cool. Um, and another beautiful day. This was kind of funny. I was, I was going to take a picture of how gaudy this telephone pole was, and this lady just happened to have his pants on her next to him. So <laughs> But that's, I just saw all this kind of this guilt everywhere, just everywhere, everywhere. I just, man, it's just kind of tacky. But, um, to each their own, I'm not going to knock it. It's just a little bit, it's a bit much for me, if you ask. Um, and more food. I remember at this restaurant, the uh, server really kind of smirked and laughed at me when I tried to talk French to him. And I was like, hey, French German nice. Of course, I have an accent, that's right. Um, this was kind of cool or interesting. Right outside of our hostel where we stayed, not only did they park on the side to have more space for road, they actually marked the parking in the sidewalk. <laughs> which was kind of interesting. <laughs> um, and this was neat because it was an electric car recharge docking station that had about four or five of these recharge <coughs> spots, which I hadn't seen. I'm sure they were, you know, if you go to New York or LA, I haven't traveled that much around here recently, but um, that's the first I'd seen of that. I thought that was really cool. And so the Jardin des Plantes, um, Jardin des Plantes. Yeah, see, that's why he laughs at me in the restaurant when I try to order. Um, Colby, you want to talk about this? Sure. We saw some super old trees. That says 1732, so that tree's older than our country. And uh, that was just kind of, kind of interesting. So you walk, you walk into it, and I, I'm going to butcher it in French. What is it, Jardin des Plantes? Jardin des Plantes. Des Plantes. They get close. I'm sorry. Look, there was there, there was some there were French Canadians that stayed in our hostel as well, and I also got you uh, two lady. Is that am I pronouncing it correct? Two lady. See, I I tried. That's that's I tried right um, as far as French goes. But um, uh, old specimens, like Justin said, you, we walked into the garden, um, and it didn't seem to be much. It, it was actually a few uh, individuals running the trails, and then as we kind of went a little further, explored a little further, we started to see all these older specimens and these tags as well, again, 1792. Um, there's a, a plane tree, 1785. Um, so not, I mean, they were significantly huge. You can tell some were better for wear than others, but um, you can, you know, you don't see that unless it's in an older specimen, I guess. Uh, just the, the character that comes along with it, um, just the, the presence that it has in that garden, and it was pretty neat. 
uh, to encounter. Also wallabies, you know, just throw them in there to change things up um, <laughs> when, whenever they come along. And so there was actually a zoo um, that was bordering the garden, and so there was an impromptu zoo visit as well. Um, coffee or espresso is going to make your trip to England or, or, and or France very, very pleasurable, or, or um, you can stay away to, to walk as much as Versailles you would like to. Um, <laughs> It's one thing that we did find a lot of walking involved, but uh, didn't mind at all. In fact, we were at a Versailles, but I wanted to mention we exited out of one of the back gates or side gates of Versailles, and we ended up in kind of um, sheep country. There was a, there's actually a farm adjacent, and I had some photos of it, but it would have just looked like I stuck a sheep farm in there. Um, but we just kept walking. Along. We actually walked around the entirety of um, over Sire, at least one half of it, trying to get back to uh, the metro. So in um, Notre Dame, of course, they tell us all throughout grade school or middle school, flying buttresses. And so you have to, you have to um, appreciate architecture while you're there as well. Again, um, and the there's a big difference between these two pictures, right? <laughs> what is it? So there was actually like big construction vehicles and throngs of people. <laughs> and we weren't going to go in because the line was too long and it was raining. So I just squatted right behind some shrubs. And I was like, we're here by ourselves. It was perfect. <laughs> so, clean picture there. So that was it. We stood up front, looked it up a little bit, kept walking. Um, this bridge actually collapsed or had a partial collapse. Did it? The gates were about to get too many locks on it, actually. No, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't during our trip, but it was uh, in the month after one of the panels on the, the bridge actually uh, actually did give way, but locks upon locks upon locks. And uh, it originally, I guess, originally started at this, this bridge, but we found it in other areas as we made our journey through France um, on the hill of the uh, Nigan French Sacre de Corps. Sacre de Corps. Okay, there we go. Um, we appreciated the views, the history, and the scenery, and the people, but um, we're still working on the language. Uh, just a, a side building that's kind of encapsulated in, in ivy. Uh, just had to stop for and say, okay, well, it's been there for a little while, and they're, I, either somebody just said, I'm through with it, I'm going to let it go, or they said, hey, let's see how long it's going to take to cover the entire building. We'll become the ivy house pub or something. <laughs> and again, always more food, right? something we can all appreciate. That's as close as we got to the inside of the loop. Oh. It was uh, raining and very cold, and we didn't really have the time. Uh, and we had not budgeted for a ticket, so we decided to um, see the architecture outside and walk around. What month was this you were over there? May. May. So and this was actually the first day on our trip that it did rain, mm -hmm. but it rained buckets. Um, we were we were held up. Um, the queue line still came out, um, and people were waiting in line in the rain, and we were kind of stuck under these <coughs> ways, um, good 30 minutes or an hour or so. Uh, but um, right outside of our our hostel, you can tell that they're fans as well. Um, Oricorio right there. Um, few others were a few specimens in the back, but it was just neat to see that, of course, an appreciation for me um, is the world over. And so, at this point, we're leaving the hostel. We're going back to London for our last two days of the trip. And I should preface, I should have mentioned it before we virtually left London the first time. We had sat down at a pub, as Colby had mentioned, um, when you bring up that you work in a Chelsea Flower Show, people become intrigued. And we had, we've been sitting, having a beer at a pub right around the corner from our hotel. We both got up to get a refill. By the time we came back, someone was sitting at our picnic table, and he was a very nice dressed businessman with a uh, leather briefcase, and he had it open, he had his laptop, and he was working. And so we're kind of just like, all right, so we're going to go somewhere else. Oh, no, we all sit here. We're like, yeah, but it's okay. He's like, no, no, sit down, we'll talk. So we started talking. It turned out to be a man named Mon Martin Osborne, who um, owns a, uh, it was a structural engineering firm, I believe, who did construction work there. And so he starts telling us and asking us and conversing with us. And um, He says, are you coming back into London? We say yes. He says, when? We tell him. He says, I'll be out in the countryside taking care of my sick mother, but if you want the true British experience, I will have my girlfriend, Yelena, 
show you around for a couple days. So here's her, here's her contact information, get in touch with her, we'll set you up. Um, he said, what do you want to get out of this trip? And so we had told him about all of the Chelsea Flasher stuff, and seeing this and seeing that, we've never been over here, we want to expand our minds a little bit, and, and then we said, well, you know, we also really want something that you can't get just being a normal tourist. We want a <coughs> true British, like you can't get anywhere else type of thing. And he said, okay, all right. And he didn't say anything else. So, then when we got back into London, we met up with Yelena, which is, we're about to get back in, and this is the uh, beer garden pub that we were staying at, um, our, our, and this is when things get fancy. So Yelena says, we're going to go do the true British experience, we're going to go to Claridge's for afternoon tea. Mm -hmm. And afternoon tea is a big deal, but Claridge's is an even bigger deal. It is the place of legend, apparently. I did not know about it until I looked it up, and it is big time. So, to get in, to Claridge's is usually about a month or two lead time on a reservation. How did we get in with one day's notice? Yelena used to work there for three years. Um, and she still knew the floor manager and several of the servers. So she was able to pull some strings and get us in for afternoon tea, which was unbelievable. We had to get clothes first. <laughs> not buying clothes. So we had to go mad dash around to get clothes. Um, but this was afternoon tea. Delicious. The service was unbelievable. The setting was marvelous. There was a table full of uh, finger sandwiches and, um, and champagne, which was on the house, which was very nice. Um, we looked at the menu, afternoon tea per person was 70 pounds a day for afternoon tea. And we're like, Lord, I'm glad we saved some money from the stipend for the end of the trip because this is going to be expensive. Um, but they said champagne on the house, we ate all that. <laughs> <laughs> at this point we're like, man, that's a lot of food, I'm kind of full. And then um, so they're like, yeah, you're not done, you got some more coming, here's scones. So, <laughs> Scones with clotted cream and jam, uh -huh. and they're like, "This is you. You are doing true British right now. You got clotted cream on your scones, afternoon tea um, at Claridge's. So we're living the high life. It was a bunch of good food, really delicious. We were walking, we're getting ready to walk out the door. We're like, we we'll take the bill, and our server says, "No, no, no, Dean, the floor manager. Dean had it. He's got it for you. He comes to all of it." And Elena's jaw dropped, and she said, "I worked here for three years." And I've been back, coming back here for three more years, and not once have I got more than a glass of champagne come from. I don't know what you American boys are doing, but we got about 400 pounds worth of free stuff. <laughs> um, so we're just lucky, lucky, lucky. Um, and then Atlanta continued to kind of show us around London from a Londoner's point of view, which was really nice, because we would have not seen a lot of stuff that Michigan wanted to see. Sure. And our guy being, uh, giving us the true British experience, she said, with the clotted cream, you have to have the sugar crust on it as well. And Claire just being the high service in, or the high service restaurant they are, they scrape all the crust off before they bring it to your table because they want you to have fresh clotted cream. So she even made special requests. And then so we felt doubly bad when yeah. the bill was already compensated. So. Uh -huh. Right on top of Claire just those are all our expanded bellies. There's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little a little display that was right next to Claire just the rest of these slides are pretty much showing Yelena where she took us as a Londoner knowing cool spots to go. Um, we did not take photos of all of it. There was restaurants and bars and we saw a bunch of architecture. She walks around and explained the history of the architecture. It was really interesting. Um, was the sushi somewhere? No, I think walking through neighbors was. So, well, I think we're taking a little while on this. Yeah. So she, had, she was the architecture lesson. She said that they built they built out as they went up because they charged per square foot as far as tax was concerned from the base floor. So the base floor was the smallest and then they got larger as they went up and you could have more home space but less taxes. Um, yeah, Holland Park. I'm not sure why we did that, but it's a nice picture, I guess. We were prompted. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Holland Park, um, obviously very, very rootsy part of uh, London, um, very expensive neighborhood. Incredible gardens because they have the money. And some incredible, some not so much. You can see who had a flair for it. This is kind of the back side. Um, this appears this is the old stables, um, and they, they're now high end condos um, because they they don't need stable there anymore. But um, it makes for a very interesting little alley that they can actually cordon off, and so you can have kids playing. You have to worry about your cars coming through. I just thought it was a pretty interesting design. So, 
something a little bit. Um, again, what I mentioned in front, some some really well landscaped, um, some green just green blobs all throughout, and then green topiaries in the windows even. Um, but some were a little more impressive than this. I just had to throw it in. It was one of the best pictures I had. And then cyclamen all the way down the, the stairways. So we kind of uh, threw that in for Tim. Um, we know how fond he is of cyclamen. It was just neat to see in the entire stairway plan of the cyclamen. So yeah, Piccadilly Square, Chicago Square, that was us after Thursday, still in our nice clothes, walking around, going to the sites, getting pictures. Uh, the sun was starting to go down. We were full. We were getting sleepy. That's where that day pretty much ended. Oh, man, I shot that. Mm -hmm. shot mm -hmm. all that way there. Um, this was the next day. So we went back out and saw some more sites. This is uh, Kyoto Park, which was a, um, essentially like a, not a donation park, but it was donated by uh, Japan to England for something that I cannot remember now, which is bad I'm giving a presentation on it. But it was a nice little park, very well put together, um, quite pretty. It was a pretty day too. It was a little bit over Kansas, but another shot of it there. Um, a really old, fat, trunked olive with a pretty small root ball on it. This is being transplanted. It's in the mine. Um, and then Linus for some environs, which you know we'll see in the woods around here, which is kind of neat seeing it grown on somebody's uh, front rail there. Um, okay, we got fancy again. So. There's the London wheel, the wheel of London. Y'all ever heard of that? You can pay uh, 20 pounds and go up on this big type of Paris wheel and see the sights. And she says, you know what? Spend 20 bucks on a cocktail. I'll take you up to Sushi Samba, which is on the 34th floor of the building and get a much better view. So that's what that picture is showing. We went up to this cocktail bar and she's like, can we get here early so we can get space? And we had a couple cocktails and then when the sun went down, the city lit up and it was really quite beautiful to see everything. Um, and you just had and this view seemed like. And then that night we continued to walk around. We ended at the, um, the London Bridge. And then there's the Shard. Um, and that's Colby and uh, Sheila, I, what's her name? I can't remember. Young Lane was a good friend. Um, so we were just walking, walking back uh, to the metro there, to the bus actually. And then where we were staying, we woke up at the window and we were like, hey, you know what, this is a little bit more our speed. <laughs> oh, it's nice clothes, it's too stuffy. So, well, Community Garden was actually um, a nice way to kind of wrap up that little experience in England. And so the next day, I mean, you know, this day we got back on the, the plane and um, we could tell when we were back in North America uh, with this next picture because look at that, that's, a, that's American right there. <laughs> Coors Light bottles and hoagies. So, um, that was pretty much it. We, we wrapped up. That was on the return leg. And uh, I know we talked a lot. And we're all over the place. But if anybody has any questions and wants to even further talk, we can do it. How'd you like their beer? Um, it was not as warm as I thought it was going to be. It was going to be this warm, hard to drink stuff. But see, I drink warm beer here. So it was actually it was nice. It was good beer. It was a large selection. One of, the, one of the jokes that I need to make, but I think another reason that door, another reason the doors were open for us is not only were we there for the Chelsea Flower Show, but uh, Hugh Jackman was here with us as well. Um, I can't tell you how many times, how many times, uh, are you Hugh Jackman? Are you his stuff? <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think that opened, opened up the doors in the UK as well. Any questions? does the flower show, the Chelsea show, go on? How long do those flowers have to look nice? It's a two-day event, I believe. Oh, it's before. just, just Yeah, it's days. either two or three. It's not a very long one. I think that's how it goes. Yeah, the first day, the, the Queen and royalty get to visit all by themselves, and then it's, it's open. So yeah, to the public, I think it's, it's two or three days Is after there, that. There's a dinner open for... For the exclusive euro for 700 pounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for <laughs> seven. Yes, sir. Is, is the growing season season in London about the same as here? Or looks like it. Uh, I mean, it's a different kind of season too, though. Um, the the moisture and temperature differences are enough that there might be things growing at the same times of year, but they're going to be vastly different things that are growing. Um, so. I, Yes and no. I mean, you could go over there and see stuff at the same time you see stuff here, but you won't be able to transplant your garden over to London and have it survive. Yes, ma'am. I wasn't clear about who actually was building your 
pavilion, your booth. Okay, so um, we went under the invitation of Krug Farm Krug Nursery, Farm. who was supplying the plants for Sophie Walker, who was the designer, okay. who was pretty much organizing the construction. Um, in previous years, Krug, Krug Farm Nursery had simply been um, one of the inside the Grand Pavilion plant displays. They had just shown their wares, look at all the plants we have. This year, they were actually using their plants for a more artistic purpose in that pavilion. And what did they get out of it? Like can pe are people doing business with them? Massive there? exposure. Oh. So when Crook Farms Nursery accepted the invitation to go, they said that their business absolutely erupted. They had had good business up until then, but then once they went to the show, and they actually placed gold, which in a, where you place is a good thing. So if you place highly, you are on the map for a lot of people. So their business just exploded after. So it's just it's huge, big, big money. That's why people are willing to put so much into it for the displays, because if they can show so well and, and place well, then that means a lot more money on the back end. And part of the discussion each day was kind of what they had, what they had saw, who was who was featured last night on what news station, or, or who was in what article at that morning. And so um, exposure is a huge deal with the show. That was at the top of Sushi Sambo, where I was sitting there kind of goofy with Devil Martini, and there's a weird <laughs> there. Um, this was on the top of the outdoor, uh, outdoor patio bar area. I just thought it was really cool. It lit up at night there. It glowed very warmly. 